Hello, uh, my name is Diego Toral. I work as a graphics software engineer at Igalia. And uh, I'm uh, one of the developers of the Vulkan V3DB driver for Raspberry Pi 4, uh, which we presented here at XCC last year. And today's presentation is going to give an update on what we have been up to for the last 12 months um, and where we are today. So um, this is um, the structure that I prepared for this presentation. We are going to start with a very quick recap of where we were a year ago. And then I'm going to uh, detail uh, what has changed since then, uh, what new features and improvements we have brought to the driver. Uh, one of the areas in which we focus, especially in the first uh, months of the year was performance. So I would like to go in details there and explain what kind of work we did um, and what kind of results we achieved. And then I would like to uh, finish the presentation with some thoughts about things we might be working on um, for the next 12 months maybe. So starting with a quick recap of where we were a year ago when we presented at XTC the driver for the first time we had a minimal uh, Vulkan 1.0 implementation. Um, and when I say minimal, I really mean fairly minimal in the sense that Vulkan 1.0 allows for a many optional features and of course extensions that we just didn't have. Um, we were also not conformant at that point. We were kind of getting very close, uh, but we were still at the point where we were Kind of squashing the uh, last few uh, CTS test failures. Uh, we had not merged the driver in the upstream Mesa repositories yet. We were starting discussions. Uh, actually, we think I think we started discussing this with upstream right after XCC. And one of the issues I mentioned we had was that the the driver was still you know, fairly immature in, in, in terms of actual testing. We had been testing with CTS um, and we had been testing with some, you know, uh, um, relatively simple games such as the Quake Classics or other demos such as demos from the Cecil Williams repositories. Um, but we had not been able to test with like, you know, more modern uh, applications and games as you will. Um, and a good part of this was related to the fact that well, we were still getting there with the driver um, and focusing on just developing the, the features and not so much as you know, not so, not so much testing yet. And the other part of this story was that the the reality of working and applications and games available for Linux ARM wasn't really that great, right? Um, so that was one of the issues we had at the point. So fast forward one year uh, to present day, let's see where we are. Um, so obviously some of the things um, um, that are probably well known by this time is, is that we merged uh, the driver upstream and we have been developing upstream ever since. Uh, another thing we did is to uh, integrate our internal CI with the upstream GitLab CI. Um, and this has been very nice for both the OpenGL and the Vulkan drivers, uh, not, not only because it makes regression um, um, checking a lot easier and, and, and preventing regressions a lot easier, but also because it makes it easier for external contributors to test their patches before sending them for review. Um, and the other thing we did, of course, was to obtain Vulkan 1.0 conformance. And I think this will happen all either before the end of the last year or very early uh, after. So um, all the things we've been working on is Vulkan 1.1. Um, so we currently, I think, have a minimal Vulkan 1.1 implementation, which again is not yet conformant. Um, we are working um, on finishing the last uh, test failures that we have. We have a few flaky tests and things like this. Um, so I think we are not very far from uh, being ready to uh, to claim conformance. So hopefully this is something that we will be able to achieve soon. Um, we have also been getting a bunch of additional extensions and optional features that our driver can support. 
some of these were also contributed by external developers, which is great. <clears throat> uh, we also have better um, uh, Windows system integration uh, these days. Um, and again, this was thanks to external contributors, particular, particularly they uh, provided support for well and, and direct display, um, which is also very nice. Um, and as I suggested before, um, we have been working on improving performance and there have been some significant improvements in this regard as well. <clears throat> so another thing that we got working is RenderDoc. Uh, so RenderDoc was actually working, I think, uh, one year ago, but there, there were some annoying bugs that kind of made it difficult to use in practice. So um, we did manage to get this fixed and at least in my testing, I think it was working fine. Um, we also got GFX Reconstruct, which is this tool that allows you to save traces for a game and reproduce them afterwards. Um, this is something that we got working for our own purposes, um, as I will describe later when we discuss performance but it's a useful, really nice tool that's available for developers and that should be working fine as well. And uh, I mentioned before that one of our issues last year was the lack of real world testing. Uh, in that regard, I think we also made some, some improvements. Uh, we uh, were lucky enough to get uh, our hands on um, uh, some Unreal Engine 4 samples um, binaries that were compiled for the Raspberry Pi 4 um, by some other people um, who made them available to us. Um, and while these are still, you know, just small demos, um, they were useful in testing our driver with more modern workloads. And we are happy to report that these are, are working fine. Uh, and they were also very useful to uh, drive some of the performance optimization efforts that I'll discuss later. So, um, um, as you can see, there's been a lot uh, of new things uh, happening uh, during the last year. And as I mentioned, one of our focuses for, for that period of time was performance. So let's, let's see a bit what we did there. So, um, as I said, we uh, got our hands on some Unreal Engine for samples, and this was for us a great opportunity to use this more kind of modern uh, um, game code to test where how, how well the, the driver was doing. Um, and what we found is that we were um, generally GPU limited, which is, I guess, what you would expect and what you would want uh, when you are developing a driver. You, you do not want to be CPU limited because that could point to issues in the driver. So I think this was ideal, um, at least at first. I think there was only one game that at some points was CPU limited and it was this racing game that is there on the uh, bottom right uh, section. The issue there was that uh, that game was emitting a very large amount of collision queries and our implementation for that was not optimal. So we proved that and kind of that got rid of the CPU limitation. Uh, I think that's basically the only case where we were CPU limited. So generally we were GPU limited and what we found is that these Unreal Engine 4 samples were a lot more expensive in terms of shading than anything that we have run through the driver before, which makes sense, right? Um, so we focus most of our performance work, not only, but most of it, and at least the, the part that I'm going to discuss here on, um, on the shader compiler, um, which is great in the sense that it, all the optimization work we did here was not only useful for Vulkan, but also for the, our OpenGL drivers, because um, we shared the, the, the shader compiler, basically. So in terms of performance, what we did was, uh, I mean, like the process uh, is very basic and probably what you would expect. We basically capture generated shader code from these Unreal Engine 4 samples. We try to identify uh, not optimal uh, code traces by eyeballing these, these, uh, cap these, these captures um, for a very long amount of time, really. Um, 
So once you have identified non-optimal code traces, you have to trace them back um, in the compiler stack to understand when and why they are generated. And then you start designing and thinking about ways in which you can do uh, better code generation for these situations. And after you have an implementation for a particular optimization, then you have you need to find a way to verify the results. Um, and here is where things sometimes get tricky. You know, sometimes the optimizations are um, like produce very obvious results, and you just run the game, and just the the frame rate is just better, right? It's it's obvious. Uh, even for Unreal Engine for samples, which are at least on our platform, have a wildly varying uh, frame rate behavior. Like um, I guess Unreal Engine is doing its own thing um, under the hood, and even if you are not modifying anything, even if the camera is static, nothing is going on, nothing is changing, the frame rate can suddenly drop or increase for no obvious reason. Um, uh, but beyond that, uh, there are like other issues, like sometimes the performance optimizations are are um, not so large that they kind of get uh, lost in the nose of the frame rate variance and things like that. So um, in some cases, it was relatively easy. Some, some of the demos have a more stable frame rate than others. Uh, but in general, um, so what we did to verify the results was a combination of manual testing in some cases. In other cases, we would just capture traces with GFX reconstruct uh, and reproduce them with GFX reconstruct to, um, to make sure basically that the workload we were testing was exactly the same and then we could easily test the patch against them uh, and, and see the performance output difference. And of course, we always have shader DB, which for those who don't know is this large collection of, of shaders uh, from various games that we can run through our shader compiler and extract uh, um, stats on the generated code to see how we are improving or regressing on various fronts. So in terms of what we actually did, um, so as I said before, all these Unreal Engine for samples have in common that the shading is fairly expensive, at least in comparison to other things we have seen before. Um, so for example, it was very common for many shaders to have upwards of uh, 60 memory accesses uh, from a shader, um, which include um, texturing and UBOs, for example, uh, per pixel or, or per vertex. Um, so that was kind of high and we suspected that that was a bottleneck for our platform. Um, um, so the unit that was involved with that is called the TMU in our platform. Um, and one of the things we did there was better pipelining of these operations. So uh, typically we would just emit a, for example, a texture fetch operation and then we would switch to another thread, which is the way that our hardware allows us to hide the latency from the texturing operation. And then as the, the, we return from that other uh, thread, we would immediately uh, try to retrieve the result and install automatically if that the result was not there yet. So we could do a bit better and try to queue. In some cases, there are restrictions, but in some cases we can queue more than one TMU operation, uh, for example, and then we could try to do better postponing actually um, accessing the result from that test your operation until it was absolutely necessary to try and hide the latency better. And that provides some, some improvements, um, but maybe not as much as we thought it would be. I think we got something like three or 4% improvement from that in some of the samples. What did make a huge improvement though was and the fact that uh, we realized that some of these UBO operations uh, are typically constant across all SIMD lines, which basically mean they are uniform loads um, somewhat. So for this kind of uh, fetches, we can use a different mechanism in our hardware that provides or has the capacity for sequential reads. It has the capacity to provide us with a 32-bit value, uniform value uh, per cycle. Uh, which is much better than what we can get with the TMU. So um, there is some setup every time that you want to fetch uh, with, with this mechanism. But the key here is that many of these UV reds usually fetch multiple 
uh, 32 bit sequential values. Uh, so, for example, if you're loading a VEC4, you are actually doing four sequential scattered accesses to memory, which is perfect for, for this mechanism. But beyond that, even if you have uh, structures in the UBOs, it's very common that applications read them sequentially. And even if they don't, our compiler can reorder some of these to make them sequential. Um, so by using these and optimizing this process as much as we could, uh, we saw up to 20 or 30% performance improvement with some of the shader workloads and with some of the samples, which is a huge improvement. Um, all the things we've been working on have to do with the capacity that our hardware has to emit multiple instructions in the same cycle. So there's, of course, a number of restrictions that could prevent that, but we found that our compiler was in some cases being uh, too conservative with this. Um, and so uh, improving flexi uh, scheduling flexibility for that and uh, um, it, it was kind of important to improve this. And the other thing we did is there was a bug, I think, that was preventing us from merging instructions um, uh, as much as we could that I think only by itself improved code generation uh, by four or five percent, I think. So the other thing we noticed is that um, all these shaders had a lot of variance between the vertex and the from and shader stage. Uh, and our code generation for uh, uh, smoothly interpolated variance was not really optimal. So in theory, uh, when we have a smooth interpolated firing in our platform, we need three instructions uh, to produce the, the final interpolated value. Um, uh, but if you are using the hardware optimally and pipelining these instructions properly, uh, after the first variant, you can produce one per cycle. Um, but for reasons that go beyond the scope of this presentation, this wasn't happening. And uh, we were only able typically to produce one every two cycles. Uh, so when you have a lot of variants, such as in this kind of workloads, uh, that was also a, a hit on performance. And that's something that we also managed to, to improve very significantly. And these are only some examples. There were many other smaller optimizations that we did here and there. Uh, that also contributed to the to improving the overall performance. Uh, but I guess this gives an, an idea of what were some of the main things we did. So how does that translate to actual results? So in terms of shader DV uh, improvements, um, I just put here some of the, what I think are some of the most important results. So the first row here, uh, we improved thread count by a bit over uh, 1%. So threads, as I said before, is the mechanism that our hardware has for hiding latency from uh, memory access from shaders such as, such as texturing. So improving, increasing the thread count here is, is better. It's a good thing. And then we reduce the total instruction count for, by 9%, which is a huge reduction, really. Um, it basically means that uh, on average, uh, our shaders are 9% smaller in code size, which means obviously that they require less cycles to execute. Another thing we did is to reduce uniform counts. Um, so there is a lot of state in our platform that has to be consumed by the shaders uh, through uniforms. And this is for OpenGL in particular, this is one of the main causes of CPU overhead because every time that you have a draw call, that needs to change some of its uniforms to represent a state change, you need to rewrite the entire uniform stream for that draw call. Um, so reducing uniforms helps alleviate this and reduce the CPU overhead. And we also, even though we haven't identified this to be a huge cause of CPU overhead, at least with the samples we've tested on the Vulkan driver, uh, a 6% to 7% reduction is it's still very significant. And even if it doesn't help as much on Vulkan, it should definitely help the, the OpenGL driver. And the other thing that I put here is spill and fills. As you can see, there's also a significant reduction uh, for these stats as well, which means basically that we are spilling less and, and using the register uh, file that we have available more efficiently, which is great. 
Um, so the next question is how does this translate to actual game performance? Um, I have here a bunch of different games and samples that we have been testing with. And uh, on the y-axis, you have frame rate improvements in percentage. So as you can see, there, is, there are improvements all across the board, um, no matter what kind of game, even for the Quake Classics, there is significant improvements. But the, the, the larger improvements happen on the Unreal Engine 4 samples. Uh, I have to, uh, the third and the fourth bars here are the shooter demo from Unreal Engine 4 with low and high-end uh, settings, uh, respectively. As you can observe, these are the two samples that got the most benefit, which makes sense since these are the samples and the shaders that we use to drive the, the performance optimization efforts. These are also the most complex shaders in, in this collection of samples. So it also makes sense that they are the ones that have the most opportunities for, for being improved by these optimizations. But the, the nice takeaway is that the improvements are really seen all across the world. And as I said, we would expect a, a significant part of the optimizations that we need to also benefit the OpenGL driver uh, to a similar extent. So uh, there is a caveat with all the performance work that we did, and it's that many of these optimizations have a cost, which is uh, it comes in, in, the, in the form of increased register pressure. Um, so in order to um, kind of alleviate this, what we did is to um, have a mechanism by which our driver can try really hard to um, um, disable certain optimizations when it, try, it, when it's, it needs to spill, basically, to compile the shader. Uh, so we have a mechanism that can iteratively disable optimizations that are known to potentially cause additional register pressure with the hopes that we can produce the best uh, form of the shader possible that doesn't spill. Uh, now, I should say that this increases uh, compile time a little bit, which was already an issue. Uh, in fact, you can see with any of these Unreal and you for samples, um, I was a bit surprised actually about this because this being small samples, I would expect that Unreal would just compile all the pipelines before the, the gameplay loop. But it doesn't. It does compile some pipelines. In fact, as soon as you move the camera, uh, it will compile some pipelines, and you can see the game freeze when that happens. Um, so, um, I mean, this was happening even before all these optimizations, and this was just making it even slightly, but even if it's slightly, slightly worse. Uh, so what we did to alleviate this was to implement the disk cache, which uh, works really well. Um, it won't help you in the first playthrough, but definitely helps in playthrough solid in the first. Uh, this is something that we did only for the Vulcan driver for now, but uh, probably it's something that we might want to do for OpenGL as well in the future. I would also like to comment on a few, um, uh, I guess, lessons that we learned from this process. One is uh, we uh, initially uh, have been working on a, I, I think this was work started by Emma, um, on a near scheduling uh, uh, implementation that was useful. Uh, it, it gets some of the job done, but we found uh, that uh, maybe near is not exactly the best place if you want to really, you know, get the most of of the scheduling. Um, for example, our near scheduler at present tries to separate as much as possible all the texturing from uh, all the all the texture. I mean, the texturing from when you actually use the results, which makes sense, right? You are trying to hide the latency. But it doesn't account for the fact that there are limitations in how many texture operations we can queue and how much register pressure this can increase on our target platform. It has some heuristics to try to kind of balance these two things, but in practice, they don't always work really well. And I think by doing this at the VR level in the future, we might be able to do better. Uh, the other thing we saw is that producing better VR which, by the way, is like an intermediary representation of the shader code that's very close to the assembly, but not quite there yet, but it allows us to incorporate some of the hardware semantics into it. Um, so sometimes we do an optimization that produces better VR, but we ended up producing worse QPU code, which is the actual assembly. And this was because of register allocation. It turns out that in our platform in particular, register allocation plays a fundamental role 
to allow for our capacity to merge multiple instructions. Um, so depending on how register allocation worked for a particular uh, code, uh, sometimes it would actually lead to worse QPU, um, even if the, origin, the, the starting point was better. Um, we actually um, fixed, or at least I think we improved some of the heuristics involved with um, register allocator which uh, according to shader that we produce clearly better results uh, but uh, before we did this we actually dropped some of the optimizations uh, because of that um, so i think in the future we might want to revisit some of them and see if our register allocation and keep you scheduling is now up to the task to to to, to really make good on the on the better fear um and then uh, I mentioned how we are now having multiple compiler strategies that iteratively disable some optimiz optimizations to produce the best version of a shader we can possibly produce. But these are not, I mean, this process is not always optimal. And sometimes this is not exactly what happens because we kind of assume that if we have high register pressure and we need to spill uh, and we disable this optimization, which is likely to produce higher register pressure, we are going to have a better version of the shader that that less is spilling and that's not always the case um, so i think we could even do a bit better by trying to sometimes remember what was the best strategy instead of always assuming that the next strategy is going to be better all right and so that's that does it for kind of the um, performance work we did and now uh, we would like to discuss a bit what, what what may happen in the future with our plans for for the next year or so now this is still very early stage nothing of this is confirmed but here are some early thoughts so obviously we have Vulkan 1.1 1 .1 conformance um, in our uh, sites uh, we are finishing up work for that I hope we can submit this before the end of the year um, we know we still have a large backlog of optional features and extensions that we haven't implemented yet um, and it would be nice to focus on this we had a few requests for some of these uh, to support emulators and things that people may like to use with our driver on the raspberry pi 4 so we would like to support that going forward if we can um, it might be interesting to try to understand how uh, medium p um, uh, 16 bit um, uh, could improve or not our performance our register allocation process i would like to investigate that a little bit um, generally we would also work want to work on performance a little bit more i think there's always things that you can keep improving um, we also i think this is important at this point improve our kernel interface so when we presented the Vulkan driver a year ago, we mentioned that um, uh, we were reusing exactly the same interface that we use for the OpenGL driver. And this doesn't really match um, the semantics that Vulkan has perfectly. And because of that, there, we are limited in some ways where um, I think we, we don't want to continue being limited. And this affects performance, but also uh, some hacks that we had to do in the driver. I would really love uh, to see some of these uh, gone uh, and improved. And then maybe, of course, we could always start thinking about work on one two once we obtain conformance for one one. I don't think this should be an immediate prior priority for us. I would rather focus on, as I said, um, uh, supporting more extensions and features than focusing on Vulkan one two. But of course, this is always going to be a possibility. So, and that's it for this presentation. Um, so if you want to stay in touch with us, reach out, um, ask questions, whatever. Uh, you can uh, talk to us at the video core channel uh, at of, of TC. Uh, we are also on uh, uh, the Mesa Devil uh, mailing list. And of course you can file bags or, or feature requests uh, uh, on the Mesa GitLab. And if you want to just follow uh, development progress, both Alejandro and me usually uh, blog every now and then about uh, about that. So 
just you can just follow our blogs. So that's it. Um, I think we have some time for questions, and if you have any, I would love to try to answer them as best as I, as I can. And I would also like to uh, let you know that Igali is always uh, seeking out people who are passionate about um, uh, free software, about Linux, about um, graphics. So if if you would like to work on this stuff, just let us know, and we would love to to know about you. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. OK, and we're ready to go with the QA session. Welcome, Yagdral. And now we have a few questions here from uh, IRC. Uh, the first one is from Eric Engstrom. What's a QPU? OK, so a QPU is like the shader core in the Raspberry Pi uh, Broadcom GPU. Uh, and we also use QPU to refer to the native assembly uh, of, of the QPU processor. All right, another question from JMS. What's near and near scheduler? OK, so, um, so near is just a representation of the shader code that it's translated by Mesa. Um, so we get the GLSL or Spare B code from, from the application, and it is translated into a different representation, which is near, which is then used to optimize and run you know, a number of lowering and, and optimization passes. And the scheduling aspect refers to decisions that are made at that level about the ordering of the instructions. So which instructions are emitted uh, early, which instructions are pushed back. And this is, for example, done to hide latency from texturing operations. So if you have a texture operation, and then later on you use the result from the texture operation, the nearest scheduler will try to put the texture operation early. So you have instructions in between the texture operation and when you actually use the result to hide the latency from, uh, from, from, from that operation. And what I mentioned there is that um, instead of doing this at the near level, where, which is completely hardware agnostic uh, and doesn't understand many of the concepts of the underlying hardware, we would probably like to do this at the VR level, which is a different uh, lower level shader representation that knows about the target hardware. It's specific to the Broadcom GPU, to the V3DB driver. And there we can incorporate additional semantics that can allow us to do scheduling better. All right. Bas Neuenhuisen asks, any plans for a Kronos Vulkan 1.0 submission? Yeah, so Vulkan, we are already conformant for Vulkan 1.0. This happened like almost a year ago. And what we are now getting ready is for Vulkan 1.1. And I hope that we can do this before the end of the year, hopefully very soon. Does the Raspberry Pi have a tiling GPU? If so, have you looked at some of the experimentation Fredrino had on maximizing the length of each render pass? Right, so yes, it's a tiling GPU. And no, I'm, I'm, I haven't looked at that yet, but we, I guess we will be interested in that. I mean, we know there are some things that we can do. Uh, for example, our driver can merge surpasses in some cases where basically the application is not being smart at, at, and it's splitting things in surpasses that it shouldn't do. But other than that, we are not very good at that. Um, we also have a suboptimal optimization of input attachments that, where we could do better. Uh, but yeah, I would, I would be interested in looking more into the web free did. One more from Bass. Nice to see GFX reconstruct being useful for testing. Has it also been useful for performance testing? Actually, we used it for performance testing specifically. So we had this problem where some of these Unreal Engine demos, um, they would either spawn the camera at different locations every time, or at different points in time, they would just have different performance behaviors without, you know, probably due to the game code, not, not our code. So um, we use GFR Reconstruct to make sure that we could test the patch against the exact same uh, uh, GPU workload. Uh, and it was very useful for that, yeah. Fire asks, do you have any good profiling tools for people optimizing their games or programs on the Raspberry Pi? Uh, no, I mean, I mean, we have to, to optimize the CPU side code, you, you we just use, you know, your choice of CPU profiler. There's nothing specific for for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, 
Uh, and for the case of optimizing on the GPU, there is a bunch of things that we may use, but like like we can dump shader code and things like that. But there's nothing specific that is particularly useful in the, in this in this regard. I guess a combination of um, GFX reconstruct, render dog, CPU profilers, and things like that is all that we have. I, I would love to see better tools, but for for the time being, that's that's what we have. Okay, that's it. Looks like that's all from the audience. Thank you very much for your talk, and well, have a good conference. Thank you. You too.